three, two, one. Professors, it's excellent to be here with you on this Thursday evening, October 5th, 2023, on a mini episode of Three Deeper Cuts podcast. Three Deeper Cuts is your lifestyle magazine for the practicing surgical pathologist. Every week, we bring you something to read, something to think about, and something to listen to. All right, friends. This is a piece called 10 Questions That Will Change Your Life. This was written by Mr. Ryan Holiday of Bastrop, Texas. Uh, this little bookstore down there that I highly recommend. Uh, this thread that he wrote about a year ago, maybe maybe two years ago, uh, is something that helped me a lot. I look back on this and I just, in fact, I, I rewrote this in my own handwriting and I wrote it again with my answers to these questions and how I was implementing it in my life. So 3D Percuts podcast is basically an externalization of my own personal curriculum. And it's been so helpful to me that I figure I might as well share it so that anyone can access this on demand there's so much good content in written form, especially by uh, by Ryan Holiday and similar authors, that uh, it's nice to have it in audio form. So here we go. Ten questions that will change your life. Number one, who do you spend your time with? Goeth said, tell me who you spend your time with and I will tell you who you are. It's not just people. What you read, what you watch, what you think about, your life comes to look exactly like your surroundings. Choose wisely. Number two, is this in my control? Epictetus said, the chief task in life is to make the distinction between what is in your control and what is not. Once you do, waste no time on the latter. Number three, what does your ideal day look like? Most have big goals for the future. I think it's better to know what your perfect day looks like. Then you can ask if each opportunity and choice. Number four, is this getting me closer or further away? Life is too short to not live the way you want. Number five, will you choose a live time or dead time? Robert Green says there are two types of time. Dead time, where you let things happen, and a live time, where you make things happen. Life is always giving the choice to decide, a live time or dead time. Number six, is that who you want to be? Look at people further along the path at your company or in your field. Are they who you want to be? If the answer is no, you might want to find a different company or field. Number seven, what is your main thing? The main thing in life is to keep the main thing the main thing. If you don't know what your main thing is, how can you possibly know what to say yes to and no to? If you don't, if you don't know where you're sailing, the Stoics said, no wind is favorable. Number eight, what am I saying no to by saying yes? Everything you say yes to is saying no to something else. Taking the meeting means saying no to an hour of reading. Sw scrolling mindlessly late at night means you're saying no to a productive morning. Say no. Keep the main thing the main thing. What can only I do? There has never been anyone like you, and there never will be again. You have been given a complete and total monopoly 
over the business of being you. Your main thing is not to give that up, to be you, to, all, to do only what you can do. Number 10, what would this look like if it were easy? Got this one from Tim Ferriss. If I feel stressed, stretched thin, or overwhelmed, he says, it's usually because I'm overcomplicating something. Write it down and put it where you'll constantly see it. Simplify. Is this why I'm afraid of death? If you were suddenly given a fatal diagnosis, you'd immediately, immediately spend less time doing certain things. This is why I try to think about death at least a couple times a day. So I cut those things out now, not later. Memento Mori. Whoa, so that was powerful. Um, well, let's go back through... Those are 10 points. Go back through one, one through 10, and I'll tell you how I applied this in my life. Um, and I think this is dated in, so this is, a, this is about a year ago. Yeah, 8 22 That's when I first wrote this down. It was sometime in there. So maybe 11 4 2022. Uh, it was late summer, early fall of last year. Right about the time I was starting my, um, my job in private practice. So question number one, who do you spend your time with? This is something that I thought I didn't have control over when I was in college, uh, even high school, uh, and then going on into my career in medicine, so medical school and beyond. And it may have been a reflection of my upbringing. In the 90s, the internet was still very new, and nobody fathomed how big it would become. And in the 2000s, podcasts were fairly new, and nobody fathomed how big and how powerful they would become. Um, but as you get older, your goals start to um, become different from the people around you, and that's a good thing. If you're being honest with yourself, it tells you that maybe you need to be working on something a little bit different. And the friends that I had made in medicine up until then, they, they tended to be really bright people who did not have a lot of drive. School came very easily to them in their early years and they naturally gravitated towards medicine. Um, and it wasn't just medicine, it was friends that I made who later went into finance and um, other industries. Uh, I realized that my peer group, um, whether that was group chats I was in or um, people that I would hang out with on weekends uh, or just, you know, just casual dinners that I would agree to, to go to, I realized that none of those people were interested in building a newsletter and podcast. So I, I had to eventually ask myself, why am I hanging out, hanging out with these people? Uh, not that I only hang out with people that are interested in the exact same, you know, goals, in this case, the newsletter and podcast, but it was also just, you know, my profession. So why would I associate people who don't want to be the absolute best doctor they can possibly be? It, don't, it doesn't make any sense because there's a lot of people in medicine that kind of have this negative attitude and maybe they're not really satisfied with medicine, but at the same time, they're not willing to put in the work to build something else that may give them more satisfaction. And this got worse in my fellowships. Uh, everyone around me just always seemed to be complaining. And so there was just literally a, a stretch of a few weeks where I started just writing down everybody in my life. And I actually went through my phone contacts and I just you know, I just wrote all these people down. Some of them I actually included in my little in my little um, uh, notebook as potential sketch characters down the road. Um, 
But honestly, 90% of these people that were in my phone and just in my life that I was forced to interact with through work or through long-term family relationships, I, just, I, I came to a point where I just had to confront the fact that these people are not going to help me advance my goals. If anything, they uh, will speak negatively of my ambitions and my goals. So why would I associate with them? So now the people on this email list and and the people that I associate with in real life um, and in and group chats are really only people that are, are, that are on the same uh, trajectory. Not, our goals may be very different, but the energy that we project towards each other is, is very positive. All right, next. The number two says, is this in my control? So he cites Epictetus, uh, chief task in life is to make this decision between what is in your control and what is not. So the, I noticed, especially with easy access to social platforms, it started with Facebook and Instagram and also Twitter. And it is this tendency to, to be comparing yourself to other people. And this is a biological process called mimesis. All primates do this. We can't not do this. But the trouble with surrounding yourself with other people's successes is that you, you start to feel like maybe you should, you should be as successful or asking yourself, why am I not achieving the same things that I see other people achieve on, on Twitter and Instagram or, or wherever else? But that's a losing battle that you're, that you're fighting. You're asking yourself the wrong question. The question you got to be asking yourself is, is this in my control? You don't have any control over what people post on the internet uh, and how they conduct themselves. You can only control how you conduct yourself. So you can do an autopsy of your daily schedule and ask yourself, well, what exactly... What am I, how am I spending every, every block of 20 minutes? And you will quickly uncover wasted time here and there. And these are things that are totally under your control. And you, you might say, um, uh, oh, well, what about days where I'm feeling fatigue or days where I'm not well rested? Or what about days where I'm just totally uh, just not on my A game? And to that I will call myself out for being a, a fraud <laughs> because that was me. I used to, I used to talk like that. Um, but the cure for that mentality is just have a kid because when you have a kid, you, you don't have nearly as much free time. And so all the time that you used to use for recovery and recharging yourself, it goes away. So you just learn how to recover and recharge and re-energize yourself uh, much more quickly than you ever did before. So um, I think that some people are just really good at that. Maybe that they, they don't need to have kids, but I, I think that that's, that's like a biological check mechanism. So if you're, if you're still wasting time, you know, sit with kind of overanalyzing stuff, I, I, I would just, or, or wondering if you have enough time, I, I would just go all in and have a kid and uh, your time management will be a uh, hundred times better. Assuming you're having it with the right person. Um, that, that That's actually a pretty big deal. Um, all right, next. Uh, number three, what does your ideal day look like? Most have big goals for the future. Okay, so this is where the rubber meets the road. I knew that I was not going to be, I knew that I wasn't going to be in a good place doing direct patient, patient care for the rest of my life. And there's no way that I could have predicted that. It's just that, you know, the day-to-day -day forced interactions with people was becoming very toxic to my health. Uh, especially when it's the, the, I mean, I'm a morning person. The, the, the clearest hours of my day are in the morning. Uh, and to have those filled up, um, with appointments, it's just, it was, it was eroding just like the fabric of my soul. Uh, I, I couldn't live like that forever. So, 
um, yeah, I thought about leaving medicine altogether, but then I started visualizing my ideal day. This is before I had read this article by Ryan Holiday, but um, I started dissecting what what's really bothering me. How do I make this a win? And I knew that by leaving medicine altogether, you're taking a big gamble. Um, and I talked to a lot of my inner circle about this, and I, and and just p- people that I respected in the Navy, and they all said the same thing. They said you got to do a residency and then reassess um, because you're not really a doctor until you do your residency. So so then how do I get a residency where my ideal day is a realistic possibility? And there may be other fields that could provide this, but I think pathology is the best field for this type of personality. If you can't be bothered first thing in the morning, pathology is a good fit for you because, uh, I mean, depending on the practice, you can, I mean, as long as you're not on call, you you really can set up your day the way you want. And it will help you create some runway um, for your long-term ideal life. It, it's, it requires a lot of patience, but I tell you what, just my daily routine now compared to when I was in clinical medicine, it's more than 50% better, more than 50% better. And as we continue to, um, well, I mean, it led me to find a group that, um, I mean, I think this is, this is better in private practice because you're sharing a group with like-minded people, you know, so you don't have like 7 a.m. conferences and 8 a.m. conferences. You can just start doing your work or you can delay your work. You can mix and match however you want. So um, in reality, my ideal day would be uh, I wake up in the morning and I write for four hours. I'm not, I'm not quite there yet, but I know I'll eventually get there. I, it would take about five, to ten years, but eventually it will happen. Um, it's all right, move on. Number four, is this getting me closer or further away? Um, life is too short to not live the way you want. And this, this is where it's critically important to start saying no to things. Um, because, um, you will have plenty of opportunities in your career to do extra stuff like outside of your normal work duties. That could be like an internal hospital committee or an external committee somewhere, or a meeting to go to, or this, there's, there's always something. But you have to ask yourself, is it getting you closer or further away from your goals? The meetings that I choose now are very specific, and they are designed to make me do my current job um, as well as possible, so that I am, I am number one at my job in this hospital and my patient demographic and my, the subject, you know, like the case material that I'm seeing at this job is different than what, you know, I trained for I did more of my emphasis on GI and uh, cytology, but my job is mostly is hardcore surgical pathology. So, and it's a lot of breast UIN. There's still a good amount of GI, but, um, but there's also more lung pathology and a lot of the hardest cases are lung and, and there's no way around it. A lot of the hardest cases are breasts, no way around that. We even have a fair amount of soft tissue tumors. So I know that I'm only going to be able to work on my newsletter if I'm an A player at my job. And so I gave up everything else and focus on doing the, uh, going to the educational conferences that will advance me in, in my local arena. Uh, so, so that I will, uh, do the best job possible for these patients and also be able to write about it to provide value for you, the listener. Number five, will you choose a live time or dead time? Um, so This comes back to your day-to-day schedule and you're going to have like these weeks where you're experiencing a little self-doubt or self-consciousness or, or, or you're just straight up tired. You know, maybe like 
working like 60, 70, 80 hours. So those non-working hours, it becomes critical that you, you ask yourself, how much alive time and dead time do you need? Do you really need to, you know, watch television? Um, or can you get the same relaxing effect doing, uh, reading a book, which may lead you into your next podcast? Or, or um, if you are going to relax and do something, well, instead of just zoning out, maybe 20 to 30 minutes of focused playtime with your kid. Or if you do need alone time, then make that dead time a little bit more productive by setting a timer. So for 15 minutes, you're just going to meditate and just do nothing. You just completely zone out. Uh, or on, on some days of the week, that might even be longer, like an hour. The bottom line is that you're asking yourself this question, alive time or dead time. So you're aware of it. Number six, is that who you want to be? So look at the people further along in your path. So I've found people like this in the field of lab medicine and pathology. I have met people who have, um, who kind of run their own businesses, either as consultants. Uh, I've met people that, that run their own newsletters in this in industry. Um, I've met people that do private practice on a part-time basis. Uh, I've met people who work at large corporate labs and work three or four days a week. Um, so I'm constantly evaluating you know, the people in my life, do, do, do I want to be like them? Um, because you inevitably will become like them. And, uh, um, and for, you know, because my interests tend to be a little bit different, a lot of times I, I don't come into contact with those people. Um, and so that's where uh, reading is so critical. So you surround yourself with the books, books written by the type of people that you want to be like. And podcasts um, that contain interviews of the people that you want to be like, uh, and it's it's an incredibly powerful thing. I would say it's even more powerful than it, the energy well spent in reading and absorbing the right podcasts. If you could just pick like five books and five podcasts and then just re-listening to them, that I mean, it may not be a real friend that you're talking to in real life, but um, I think when you when you marinate yourself in the type of stuff that you want, you just become a happier, positive, more positive person, and then and then you just radiate this energy, and people are just kind of drawn to you. At least that's that's what I found. Uh, number seven, what is your main thing? The main thing in life is to keep the main thing. The main thing. Okay, so yeah, so when I'm feeling a little bit scattered or lost, I just break out my notebook uh in an evening or early morning and i just do a brain dump every everything on the runway like tasks or even administrative stuff that like i just have to get off my mind and then i focus on like the meat and potatoes what am i really trying to pull off here i'm trying to pull off being you know a working doc who also has a newsletter and podcast so uh i just keep on writing down that goal over and over and over again and, um, and it's powerful. It definitely keeps you on track. And I mean, there's a, there's a, a line in the almanac of Noval where he talks about, uh, the, the universe isn't going to give you everything, but the universe will give you one thing. And for me that what I want is a newsletter. Uh, and everything, like everything that I have ever wanted revolves around the practice of writing even even podcasts, a lot of my podcasts are just reading out loud stuff that I'm writing. I'm just externalizing the, the editing process because a lot of the content that I use, I chop up and I reuse. So, um, so yeah, that's number seven. Number eight, uh, what am I saying no to by saying yes? Gosh, this is so powerful. And a lot of the times we feel the need to ingratiate people that we've met along the way and say yes to things even though we don't really want to do it. And I, that is some very dangerous behavior. And I got myself into a lot of trouble over the years by just trying to be too nice and just agreeing to stuff. Um, and, it, and it cost me, you know. 
it, it cost me accomplishing stuff that, I mean, the stuff that I'm doing now, I could have been doing 10 years ago. I had the time. I had actually more time. Um, but uh, I think I was just cluttered with saying yes to too many things that weren't really supporting the main long-term goal. All right, number nine, what can only I do? Um, so yeah, this is going back to that personal monopoly. So there, there's actually no newsletters and podcasts uh, in this genre. Like there, there, there's there's no niche like this. Nobody's doing this. Uh, uh, I mean, there there might be a few podcasts out there, but I mean, I've done the research. Very few of them are, are consistent and very few of them are any good. Um, and I mean, look, that, I might sound arrogant when I say that, but uh, uh, somebody who's building something similar to, similar to me wouldn't wouldn't see that as arrogance. It's just um, it's just belief. I, I I believe this to be true, and I've done the research to back it up. Um, so uh, so find what only you can do, uh, and again, this ties back to the Almanac of Naval. Uh, create your personal personal monopoly. Um, Number 10, uh, what would this look like if it were easy? So I love this line by Tim Ferriss about overcomplicating something. Um, uh, and I actually did print this out and paste it on my wall in my, in my office behind, behind the little shelf. Uh, so I, I, look, uh, I look at it and it's just sitting past my computer monitor. Uh, and I find this to be true over and over again because... When things are overwhelming, you're overcomplicating it. You'd be surprised how much you can accomplish with uh, a 20-minute nap or 30-minute nap, a 20 to 30-minute brain dump, just write down everything that's on your mind, and a 20 to 30-minute walk. You'd be surprised at how, how you can blow past obstacles that you thought were a big deal by just, by just doing that, by... But just getting all the clutter out of your mind and and realizing that you're just overcomplicating and creating a lot of stress out of nowhere. And lastly, is this why I am afraid of death? So me memento mori, meditating on the fact that you will eventually die and know this is going to matter. Um, that's an incredibly powerful tool uh, to use in your day-to-day -day life because you stop taking yourself so seriously. You stop taking everything you know, everything else, uh, you know, that's coming your way so seriously. Um, and you, it allows you to laser in on the things that actually matter to you, um, especially on relationships, you know, like time with family. So, so that is, uh, the 10, 10 part article, uh, 10 step article by Ryan holiday, 10 questions that will change your life. And that was the three deeper cuts, uh, version of that piece. Uh, if you're not familiar with Ryan Holiday, I would check out dailystoic.com uh, and get one of his books. It does, and always doesn't even matter which one. Just just get one of them uh, and um, you know and tear apart. You'll you'll get a lot out of it. So this has been a Thursday night episode of Three Deeper Cuts podcast. Thank you for listening. This is the Lifestyle Magazine for the Practicing Surgical Pathologist. Every week we give you something to read, something to think about, and something to listen to. And if you're not a pathologist and you're listening to this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And until next week, professors, stay hungry and definitely stay curious. Peace.